Good evening and welcome to the Suffolk School Committee meeting of Tuesday, March 27, 2012. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Gen item two, public input. Is there anyone from the audience that wishes to address the school committee? Come right up to the uh, microphone. That's cool. I guess this is a good time for me to come up. Um, could you I just state your name so they can oh, put it in yep, the record? Charlene please. Cloutier, I'm an art teacher at West Street School. And I have a copy of this, if you'd like to take one and pass them down. All right. Um, this is a proposal. We currently, uh, we recently had a meeting with the superintendent about the scheduling for next year for the special area teachers. Uh, the way the reconfiguration is right now um, creates a major scheduling problem um, because the schedules are based around the special area teachers and what happens is Eastford Road is basically split in half. So it has half the number of classes as the other buildings which creates people moving around. Um, so I'll just read this and you can let me know if you have any questions. And it's a proposal to keep Eastford Road just K and 1. Uh, Eastford Road would be kept intact with all the K and 1 classes, including the tre probably three transitional first grade classes. The classrooms would not have to move. The library could be kept intact at a K-1 level. Librarian specializes at the K-1 level, which is especially important because the students are learning to read. All the grade one teachers would stay in one building, so there would be an opportunity for the transitional grade one teachers to meet with regular grade one teachers in order to better prepare their students for grade one. This would save money. Eastford Road would not have to move their classrooms over the summer. Other schools, Charlton Street and West Street, would have grades two through five. This could allow for a four-day schedule rotation as the daily schedules are based around the four special area classes. Special area teachers would not have to move from building to building. Uh, my question, is there enough space at Eastford Road for all of the kindergarten plus grade one plus three transitional classes if there are three? Is there enough room there? I'm, we're listening. Our job on public input is to listen to you okay. make your proposal, then we take it under advisement. All right, so you okay. can read through it after anyone okay. think Thank about you. it. Um, and my other question, is there any reason that the current plan for Eastford Road needs to be just kindergarten plus the transitional grade one? And the reason for the request of reconsidering the grade levels at Eastford Road is that the current plan for the reconfiguration creates an uneven number of classes at the three schools with only approximately 12 classes at Eastford Road and approximately 24 classes at the other schools. The daily school schedules are based around the special area classes. This creates a major scheduling problem with the uh, special area teachers, causing them to move from building to building to compensate for a shortage of classes at Eastford Road. The current plan would force special area teachers to go to other schools. There could be a space problem if specials need to be taught at the same time. Extra rooms could be needed. And the fact that students would possibly have a different special area teacher split between grade levels. Um, it's to the advantage of the students to have one special area teacher to work with them during their time at one building and move with them through all the levels and get to know the students and their individual needs. This is definitely a strong point in having multiple levels of students in a building and it's to the student's advantage. The current plan creates extreme problems in terms of scheduling the students' classes evenly on a day-to-day -day basis. We need to keep the special areas intact in their buildings so the entire K-1 school could focus on the needs of K-1 students and the other two buildings could focus on grades two through five. This allows for special area teachers to be invested in their home buildings and allows opportunity for them to strengthen their programs by being familiar with the students and working with the same students for four years at Charlton Street and West Street. Please consider keeping Eastford Road K-1. It would be to the advantage of the students at the early levels. They would get to stay in one building for two years so they could settle in before moving on. Transitional students can be included in grade, grade one activities and be comfortable in their building instead of being the only ones who don't move forward into the next building. Regular K-1 students would be able to spend two years in one building before having to transition. Uh, thank you for your time. I hope you will consider this plan. I think it's beneficial to the students in many ways. Thank you, Mr. Scalia. Okay, well, thank you. What we'll do is we'll, ref 
we'll refer it to the superintendent to make comments and report back to the school committee about what the concerns are uh, because uh, the reconfiguration will be a regular topic at all our meetings going forward until we complete the plan. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Kluder. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the school committee? I believe uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Bishop. I know he has uh, a group of students here that are need to be honored this evening. Good evening. Uh, as our winter sports season has wound down, we had a couple of uh, basketball teams that made it into the district playoff for the first time in many years. Both our uh, varsity uh, boys and girls teams had a very, very exciting season. We traveled to Worcester for many games, and uh, it, it was a, a very good season. But we often don't give some of our other teams enough acknowledgement. Uh, this evening, I've invited to join me Miss Laura Rotondo, who is the coach of our mathletes, our math team. So if I could ask Miss Rotondo and the students to come up, uh, I think uh, she's got some information to share with the community as a whole. Thank you. Um, these are some of the students who participated this year on the varsity math team in the Worcester County Math League, uh, or it's known commonly as Waccamaw. And we do four meets a year. I'm the coach of the varsity team. We also have a freshman team. Um, but this year we had quite an extraordinary year. The students this year, we, we had one meet where we brought over 20 students, which is quite remarkable. Usually we bring between, I would say, four and 10. Um, and there was quite a lot of enthusiasm. The students supported each other, helped each other, wanted to learn new things. And I'm very proud to tell you that they came in first this year in our division in the math league. There are six teams in our division. Um, University Park, Assabet Valley, Douglas, Notre Dame, and Leicester. And we came in number one this year. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Mrs. Rotundo, could you uh, just for the public introduce all the students and uh, maybe what grade they're in and for the public? Okay. I can do the name Thank and you. you do what grade you're in. <laughs> <laughs> this is Trey Salse. This is Lucas St. Germain, Sophomore. Autumn Harvard, Senior. John Jovan, Senior. Samantha Bernard, Senior. Donovan Olivo, Senior. Casey Mitchell, Sophomore. and Kelsey Aponte. Okay, thank you. Lots of underclassmen. Yeah. Well, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the school committee, congratulate you. Uh, um, students for uh, representing the district well. Uh, we're very proud of you. It's great to have those accomplishments out there and to recognize you in front of the town so that they can see the great things that have been going, ongoing in the school. It's nice to see some uh, underclassmen as well. Uh, continue that uh, hard work. Uh, Mrs. Rotundo, congratulations and uh, good luck and thank you. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else from the audience that wishes to address the school committee? Anyone else? One more call. Seeing none. Approval of minutes. I mean, I'm sorry. Call the meeting to order. Roll call, Mr. Secretary. Mr. DiGregorio? Present. Dr. Domenico? Present. Mr. Jovan? Present. Mr. Lazo? Present. Dr. O'Leary? Present. Mrs. Principe? Present. Mrs. Woodrow? Seven present. All members present. Approval of minutes of regular school committee meeting of March 13, 2012. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Any errors, corrections, or omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor? The yeah, unanimous all present. Representative uh, report, report of the Student Advisory Committee, Ms. Helena Benoit. Good evening, Helena. Go ahead. No. Um, I'd first start, start off with a positive note. The show choir this year has, as a first year group, at each competition has moved up. We received first place in the varsity division at our last competition for our high school. And this weekend we will be competing at state finals and hope to receive first place again. The chorus had a Disney dinner and had a great outcome for both the high school and middle school chorus. Softball and baseball teams will be heading to the Cape this weekend for a small tournament. 
Seniors are working hard on scholarships since all their college acceptances are in. MCAS has started at the high school, and student advisory elections will be tomorrow morning. Thank you. Now moving on to presentation, our first presentation this evening. I'll, I'll turn that over to Ms. Ely. Yep, uh, I'd like to introduce the principal of Charlton Street School, uh, Bryant Montigny, to uh, introduce his guest from Shot North America. Good evening, Good evening, Mr. Montigny. Good evening, Mr. Jovi and members of the committee. Mr. Reilly, we are very excited and, and thrilled about our partnership with Chart North America, a leader in glass imaging and fiber optics with facilities throughout the world. They have, a, I believe, 17,500 employees. Um, tonight, we started this partnership last May through contacts with their care team, uh, outreaching to the community, and many activities have occurred and many fine activities. And I'm pleased tonight to introduce some members from SHOT with me, Marcus Kernovo, the CEO of SHOT, um, Kerry Heibarger, an optical engineer, and Vanessa Roney, a sales associate. And it, it, it's funny when we have all these high-tech people, and then last but not least, Kathleen Catarat, our reading teacher. So, uh, Marcus? Yeah, just some words from my side. First of all, I'm not the CEO of SHOT, not now, because SHOT is a global co uh, corporation. I'm the vice president here uh, for uh, our facility in Southbridge, or for our North American business, for that business unit. And thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present what uh, we do together with uh, the Child Street High School. Um, as you may hear, I'm not out of this area, so I'm from Germany. I was basically assigned to that position last year in summer. And to give you some background, um, back in Germany, where was my last position, I was the Vice President for Corporate Strategy and Development for SHOT overall global for all the 17,000 people. And uh, I was part of the team that basically developed our new vision statement. And it's very hard to give a vision statement for people all over the world, right? That can, where people can identify with that statement. And this statement is, we make SHOT part of everyone's life. First of all, that means, of course, we want to sell our products to everybody who is possible, right? But uh, the most or more important thing is also that we take it very serious to be part of the communities where our facilities are and basically contribute back to the communities because normally we benefit from the areas where we are with high-skilled employees and so on and so forth and also the towns, whatever enables us to do good business. And making short part of everyone's life Mean, means for us also giving things back. And that basically, this care program here fits perfectly into that. And the nice thing about that is, it's not directed from top to bottom. It's basically something the employees come up on their own. So that's their idea. They basically, they do it in their, in their spare time. It's not like that, that we say, okay, you have to do that within your working hours. And that's really the amazing part on it. And if it starts small, basically, you can see how it, spreads out all over the organization. I hope that Vanessa and Kerry can give you some overview what we have already achieved in, I think, now approximately one year of uh, that cooperation. Kerry, Vanessa, we have, they have a PowerPoint presentation they put together. This is really amazing. Thank you again for having us. I'm Vanessa, and this is Carrie. Uh, we just uh, can you just speak? You got to move the mic a little bit because it's kind of hard to hear from you. Okay, there you go. All right. uh, Thank you. As Marcus mentioned, uh, we're part of the care team at Shot. Uh, just so you know, we do have our own mission statement. Um, you know, really, what CARE stands for is an acronym for Community Awareness for Responsible Employees. Um, it really started quite simply because um, a group of us shot employees from both the business units wanted to have an impact within the community, a positive impact. We see our presence there and um, we basically got together and brainstormed 
ideas and on ways that we could get more involved. And Carrie mentioned uh, quite simply, you know, she goes for walks. Um, you know, at lunch, why not contact Charlton Street School? Um, so we did. And so um, after one of our meetings, uh, we had brought up, well, let's let's give Charlton Street School a call and see if there's any way that we can work together um, and get some ideas of how we can help each other. Um, so we called Bryant and we're pleased with how happy he was that we called and how open he was to have us come visit. So um, this is really, a, sorry. so this, this is some of, of um, what we received on our first visit back in March, um, our own uh, Peace Builders praise note that we got after our first visit and some of the stickers. So actually one of the ideas that um, Kathleen had during the meeting was how about you know a buddy reading program? Um, Use that other microphone, I think. Thank you. <laughs> we'll get it. <laughs> yeah, it's not you, believe me. We have problems with the microphone all the time. So um, basically, um, we uh, Kathleen again came up with uh, an idea. Why not you know work with the students um, and you know read with them because to promote literacy and it goes in line with with the school objectives we don't want to come in and disrupt the daily environment we want to add to it um, so we started and worked um, you know feverishly really uh, with Kathleen and Brian um, going back and forth with uh, this brochure just so we can make sure to get the details down and and learn what we had to do in order to be you know more involved um, there. So this is actually the final brochure uh, that we have and Kathleen has copies for all of you uh, so you can see you know more or less that, that we hit on every topic um, for SHOT as well as for Charlton Street. And this, this brochure was distributed to SHOT employees um, to get interest in uh, the program. So actually you'll see here that in May, uh, after we had come up with the brochure and after we had talked more about having a partnership, uh, we wanted to formally, you know, meet everybody at Shot, um, at, at Charlton Street that was helping us make this happen and uh, so we invited them for a visit and uh, Carrie actually gave them all a tour. Uh, we think everybody had a great time. <laughs> and um, you'll see here that uh, our entire care team is actually in this picture. Um, so it's a pretty diverse group from within both business units, ranging from you know an optical engineer to a cost analysis to um, human resource director and marketing. We, we really have um, every piece of the pie here. So this is uh, one of our first projects that we had before Buddy Reading when um, we were still getting interest built in that um, shot. We had a drive for local troops to send care packages to the troops and we had asked Bryant if they would be interested in helping us with this. Um, they also opened up donations. The students brought donations in for the troops and they also um, made cards, art cards for us to send with the care packages. Uh, here's the result of the donation drive. So these packages on the left are donations from both Charlton Street School and SHOT. And on the right are all of the, uh, the cards that the, the children made for us to send with the packages. Just um, additionally too, when uh, you'll see that they're, all the cards are displayed. Uh, when you know, Kathleen and Brian gave us these cards. <laughs> we were so excited to actually go through them and um, everything that, you know, and share actually everything that the kids had offered. So we actually displayed this in the conference room at SHOT and openly invited all the employees uh, to come and take a look. And we had it out for, I believe, four hours in the afternoon so people could just walk by at their leisure and sort of go through the cards. It was also, you know, it was nice for them and, and, and it really opened the eyes of our employees to see that, you know, we are doing something and it's, 
you know, we're receiving, you know, partnership from, you know, Charlton Street School on things that we want to do. So it actually made a lot more people want to get involved within the Buddy Reading Program and some of our other activities. Uh, last year, we actually sponsored the Spelling Bee, and uh, you'll notice we're in there too. We're able to attend that, and uh, that was, was a very amazing experience <laughs> for us, and we're actually sponsoring uh, the Spelling Bee as well this year, and we'd like to continue to do so. Towards the end of the year, I, we know there are several events at the school, so this is um, another one of the, the wrap-up events. We were invited to attend Flag Day. And um, in the, the meantime, we were trying to still build awareness of our group within SHOT, so we decided as a as a team that it would be good to start our own little newsletter of the care team and what we've been up to. So this is um, our first newsletter, mainly focusing on Charlton Street School and the initial visit, the care packages, and once again trying to get um, more people involved in what would be uh, starting at the next school year, the Buddy Reading Program. Uh, so as you know, uh, the school has summers off and we don't, uh, so we wanted to continue um, and make sure that we kept things going during the school vacation uh, within SHOT. So we thought, you know, we'd have a school supply drive and actually we did this within the two months of summer vacation and we had boxes in the lunchrooms and also you could give uh, donations to any care representative. Uh, and this was our total contribution uh, that we actually brought to the school uh, in September. Uh, presented uh, Bryant and Kathleen with these, and we actually have our maintenance crew helping us out. So, you know, it's not just us. Um, if we need help or assistance, then the rest of our colleagues definitely uh, want to be involved. And they were excited to go there and be a part of that. And then we were elated to, to have in our inbox a, a picture uh, where there's clearly some effort put forth um, on Kathleen and Bryant's part to thank us. And we actually included this picture in our newsletter and, you know, it's just amazing to see the kids and um, just how thankful everybody was for our contribution, which was easy because we just talk about it, we're enthusiastic about it and the entire care team and now other shot employees are, are really wanting to get involved and be a part of this. So, and in September, um, when the buddy reading program was just beginning, we had actually made the local news. Um, here's our article in the Southbridge Evening News. And as of today. When we wrote this presentation, it was 138 visits. I believe now we are at 145 yeah. visits of shot employees going to the school to read. So yes, we're we're very excited about this. Maybe ask Kathleen to come up and, and talk about some of the interactions with the buddy reading program. So Kathleen, good evening. Um, a few of the next slides represent our buddy reading initiative. Um, you do have the brochure that was created to inform potential volunteers about the program. Interested employees were invited to the school for a meeting where we discussed the value and impact that their time would have on our students in relation to reading skills. In addition, they received a brief training on how to read aloud and discuss books with students. I modeled some guided reading strategies with them so that they would feel comfortable um, with a small group of students. So far, we have over 140 visits where all third graders and most second graders have had at least an experience with a buddy reader. So we're really happy to have them and they have created a really nice rapport with the staff and the students. Um, they know their shot buddies, they know they're coming, they look forward to that special time that they have for reading and discussion with our shot buddies. 
Thank you. Uh, so actually, this is, um, you know, one of kind of the, the spawn-offs of our partnership. <laughs> um, Paulette Honorado, uh, she works for SHOT. She was a buddy reader, or she is a buddy reader, I should say. And um, she was able to donate a thousand books. It was actually um, an organization that she's part of that donated them. But she actually approached Carrie and I and asked, you know, could Charlton Street use these books? Um, and it's really just simply because the word got out and it's, uh, they received you know, over a thousand books. From what I understand, I believe um, the kids went home with books. Yeah, so it was like little gifts and they had created this uh, postcard on here, uh, or a bookmark I should say, uh, that went in all of the books. So not only would the kids know and you know, see the shot O, oh, but the parents would start to maybe realize that um, shot is wanting to be involved and, and help them grow. And then, uh, of course, the Southbridge Evening News, I shouldn't say of course, but Southbridge Evening News, um, they reported on the book donation, which was wonderful. And then you'll see uh, the picture with the donated by shot and the kids sort of going through the books. Um, and within shot, we also made our own local news this is a, um, the Insight magazine, which is distributed to all the SHOT employees in North America. And the CARE team and our partnership made this article. Towards the end of the year, we were invited to the winter concert. Several SHOT um, employees, the buddy readers, and some of the CARE team members attended their winter concert. We were invited. We were also given several holiday cards um, that were made by the students, and Vanessa and I displayed them once again in both break rooms at SHOT so the employees could come and look at the cards and see a lot of the work that the students had done. Um, and then, uh, of course, in uh, January 2012, uh, we had our second visit where we presented um, Charlton Street School and visitors, um, you know, with this banner that we could proudly, you know, put up at, you know, at any event. Um, I hear it's been in the front office at Charlton Street School a lot. Uh, we also presented them with a poster, um, a framed poster that is in the foyer. Yeah. So um, we're really excited to see that put to good use. Um, and we also presented them uh, with a check at that time, as you all know, as you approved for the, uh, for the spelling bee for this year, which we'll, we're looking forward to attend. And, and you know, really, we, we've only just begun. Um, you know, we have numerous other programs that were already started, uh, such as Box Tops for Education. Uh, we have a Magician Apprentice Program that's actually another spawn off of uh, Buddy Weeder, Paul K. Fegg, uh, who actually has a curriculum to, to teach the students um, you know, various approved um, concepts. And then we have um, Postcards from Around the World program, um, where we're actually sponsoring it internally, uh, putting it on our internal uh, internet, so it's the intranet. Uh, and people from around the world within SHOT are sending postcards to Charlton Street School. And they actually have that right in the, in the hallway um, when you take a right out of the, the office, the main office. And it's a whole board and there's a map. And <laughs> it's actually quite amazing to see what they've done. They're actually pinpointing. I'm not sure if one of you guys want to talk more about that program or... You'll have to see it. Um, it's, you know, from what I hear, they receive like a handful of cards, and the kids love it, and we love it. So, uh, really, thank you. Yeah, I'll add one quick thing. I just, uh, our very first slide where I showed the stickers and the card from um, the school, it, it'll be a year in two days that we made that very first visit, and we've already accomplished so much. And so, we think we're, it's only going to be great things from here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Comments? 
I'd just on behalf of the school committee, I'd like to thank you for the partnership that you've uh, developed with the uh, school district. Uh, it's, it's great and, and uh, it's something that's sorely needed nowadays. I mean, schools, communities can't do it alone and they need that partnership with anybody that we can partner with. It really is about developing those uh, bonds with the employees, employees, and, and building that community. So we thank you for taking that first step into our buildings and reaching out to us. And uh, knowing Mr. Montigny and the partnerships that he has developed throughout the uh, community with different groups, I'm sure it wasn't even any second thought that he would welcome you into the building. And hopefully we can develop that throughout the town as well with other groups and that you can be a model for those other corporations and, and groups in the town to, to come forward and participate with the kids. Uh, I just think it's phenomenal and thank you and we look forward to a long partnership with Shaw. So thank you. I'd also like to thank you but, and tell you that you have challenged other companies in town and, and uh, two companies have formed a partnership with Eastford Road School already. And uh, I know that West Street School is in a, in a uh, discussions about with one of the local banks uh, to possibly perform partnerships. So you have been an inspiration to other schools and other community uh, uh, businesses, which is really, really a testament to the, to the work that you've done. And Carrie, I know you graduated from Ohio State, so you know, <laughs> congratulations on their win last week. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. We look forward to um, another year from now coming out with uh, another presentation and all the great things that you do. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay, our next presentation this evening is, uh, I had uh, asked that this be put on the agenda uh, to have Mr. Bishop come and just uh, give us whatever he could on uh, graduation and dropout rates. And the reason for that was that we had a great presentation last week, uh, our last meeting from the, from the three students that had come before us. And uh, they, had, they had presented a number of an uh, 18% dropout rate. And this was not the first time that I had heard it in the community and it concerned me uh, that uh, whatever information is out there that we actually put out accurate numbers and what strategies we may employ as a school district to um, combat those problems. Uh, so with that, I, I asked Mr. Bishop just to be here to talk about graduation and, and dropout rates and what information he may be able to provide to the community and the school committee. Yes. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Slide. Jovan. I'm just having a little difficulty getting this to uh, zoom in. Uh, yeah. Like that. Thank you, Dr. Domingo. Uh, before I go into my presentation, I was uh, listening to uh, uh, school rep Helena Benoit this evening, and she left off a little tidbit I think she might want to share with everybody. Last Monday evening, I had the opportunity to go to the public house, and Helena was honored by the Tri-Community Exchange Club. She received an award, it's called the ACE Award, and it's uh, an acronym for Accepting the Challenge of Excellence. Uh, four students from our four neighboring high schools were all there, one from Southbridge and three neighboring high schools. Helena received this award for her uh, commitment to excellence in light of some of the challenges she faces on a daily basis. So Helena was a little bashful in pointing that out, but I will point it out tonight for her. So congratulations to Helena. Congratulations. As Mr. Jovan said, last uh, two weeks ago I couldn't be with you. Uh, I traveled down to Cheshire High School Tuesday evening with Mr. McHugh as part of the uh, Media Educators Conference that was held at Quinnipiac College the following day. But the prior evening, we were invited to tour Cheshire High School's brand new media uh, production center. As you know, we're building a new high school. We had some questions. What, what did I, we want us to look like? So they had an open house as part of this uh, conference. Tuesday evening from 6 to 8 p.m., so the timing was uh, not conducive to my being here with the students last week. However, we did follow up uh, Monday, uh, this past Monday, uh, eight days ago, Joe, Mr. Jovan and I met with the three young ladies and we, we listened to some of their things and uh, we wanted to uh, 
I asked them f for some uh, data, and they're, they're working at getting that. But I wanted to, uh, first of all, talk about the dropout rate. As far as I'm concerned, one student dropping out of school is too many, and uh, it's a chronic problem, not only in Southbridge, but statewide. Uh, as a result of that recognition, Massachusetts in the fall of 2010, the Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Education selected Massachusetts as just one of two states for the Federal High School Graduation Initiative Award and one of 29 projects total nationwide chosen for funding out of 184 total applicants. The Massachusetts Grant Project, as it's called Mass Grad, will focus on the 133 high schools throughout the state that exceed the statewide annual dropout rate of 2.9% in 2008-2009 school year. Massachusetts will receive $15 million over the next five years through this mass, mass grad project to support the statewide and local effort for high school dropout prevention, intervention, and recovery. Uh, I've been in education, this is my 34th year, 32 years in Southbridge. When I started, the, the, the Commonwealth had districts placed in kind of KOCs, kind of communities. That stopped, I'm not sure if it stopped with the Ed Reform Act in 93 or with No Child Left Behind, but all of a sudden it was, one brush was painting everybody. And uh, with that being said, I'm, they finally took all of the districts, 76 school districts, representing 133 schools statewide. These are all the schools that exceeded the 2.9% dropout rate in 2008-2009. That's how many there were. Those schools represented 74% uh, of the total dropouts in the Commonwealth. Three quarters of the dropouts came from that number of schools. They took an initiative to let's see what we can do to help those schools, of which we are one. They went back to 2008, they looked at the graduation rates, four and five years. The average state, in 2008, the average state graduation rate was 81.2, and five years was 88.4. However, this cohort was significantly lower. The four year was 66.9, uh, and the five year 72.4, as you can see. Similarly, in 89, significantly behind, 2010 and 2011. Where does Southbridge stack up with that cohort? In 2008, we were slightly behind, 2% behind the cohort, not the state average. 2009, we were 57.5. What happened? That's the end result of what took place in our district four years prior, when we had a significant cash shortfall, followed by a reduction in 60 teachers. That was your end result. It took us four years to get there, but we got there. Following year, we retrieved a little bit, up to 61.3, still 6% 6 behind, 6 behind the mass grad cohort, significantly behind the state. Finally, this past school year, we got to where the mass grad cohort is, 69%. Not great, but we are level with the type of district that we are in a cohort with. Let's talk about dropout rates. There's a difference, as I pointed out last year, between the dropout rate and the graduation rate. Dropout rates, they went back to 2008, 2009. 8,500 students in the Commonwealth dropped out of school that year. 10 years of that would reflect 85,000 people, young people, prime breadwinners without high school diplomas. The state recognizes that and they have jumped onto this, this mass grad to try to correct this. Uh, so while the state average was 2.9, our cohort was 6.3. Then they dropped to 6.0, and finally, in the past school year, the average for the cohort was 5.8. Where do we stack up with the cohort? Well, in 08, 09, we were lower. In 9.10, we were lower. And this past year, we were lower. 
When you look at South Beach High, last year's dropout rate was 5.5%. I will take that to the bank. I will take that to my grave. That's a fact. That comes from the Department of Education. We don't make these numbers up in my office. We don't count these people ourselves. They, every student in the state has a SASID number, and the state's getting real good. And they're tracking children now even beyond graduation to see what happens after they leave the schools. So they're tracking. Uh, that 5.5 represents 24 students that left our high school in the 0 10 11 school year. Of those 24 students, five disappeared over the summer. Left in June, did not return in September. We have no idea. Of the 24, 12 of those students were students that came through our district. 12 were people who transferred in. I had one, one instance, uh, the first week of school, I had four students come in from a social service agency in Newton. Two days later, one of those girls ran away and has not been tracked. Uh, another one was transferred to Brockton but never registered in Brockton, so we take that as a dropout. So these are some of the challenges that we face. Five-year graduation rate, once again, if you look down, you'll see many of our students, particularly that bottom line, we have many LEP students. We have 5% points higher than the four-year average. We have about 6% of our kids taking that extra, that fifth year to get through high school. And that's fine. I'd rather have them take that fifth year and get a high school diploma because it opens their door to a much better life. All right, so what does that all mean? What, what is Mass Grad doing for Southbridge High School? What are they doing? Well, they're bringing these schools together in work groups, study groups, and we're looking at best practices. What is, what is let's say, Springfield Science and Technology High School doing? Well, one of the things we looked at with them that, that I have an eye on, they have an, an interesting attendance buyback, because without question, the correlation between attendance and academic success is there. I think we could argue that for not one second. If you're not in our schools, we can't teach you. It's an interesting program. Uh, three hours after school buys back an absence. Something we're going to look at. Also a credit recovery lab. Uh, Mr. Ely and I and Mr. Zangi traveled up to Worcester in the fall to look at an interesting program where they have just that in an Ohio school. where. To ask kids to do credit recovery on a computer alone, those are not the youngsters that are going to have the, the, the determination to sit there and, and plug through alone. They need somebody to sit and help them and be with them and work with them. So these are some of the ideas that Springfield is using. Uh, Somerville is using an online math credit recovery. But I, I think the one that I liked a little bit, and we really want to look at this one with our new middle high school coming online. Attleboro High School has an, has an innovative school within a school community for ninth graders at risk that begins with a summer transition program focusing on the preparation for high school as they go from eight to nine. I think with the air conditioned building we have, a brand new facility, I think that's a, it's an opportunity that we should not miss. As, as just one more tool we need to use to keep kids in school and give them the best possible chance at that high school diploma. I don't think there's any doubt the financial benefit to a high school diploma, the, the financial benefit to a college diploma. These are real facts. So these are some of the initiatives that we're looking at. We'll also be working with MassGrad. Uh, they have a pretty good uh, webinar series. The one we're looking at of great interest is June 7th, where they have a webinar on parent engagement. I want to hear what other districts are doing to get parents in. As you know, at the high school level, all high schools, it's difficult to get parents in, and I, it's really difficult at, the, uh, at South Pachai to get parents involved. Uh, and the other thing the state is recognizing, finally, and I talked to Senator Moore last Monday night up at the public house about this, the legislature is on the cusp of raising the dropout rate to 18. That's, I believe that's probably going to be a, a, a truism come on next school year. So uh, the, these are exciting things. I think these are things that will help our students and our community. That's why I just wanted to clear up any misconceptions about what the dropout rate and the graduation rates are at South Beach High School. Is there any questions I can answer? Questions, you? comments? Uh, Mary Ellen, uh, Ms. Principe, and then Dr. Domenico. Uh, yeah, I do have a couple of questions. I was 
I'm a little confused when I read this. Um, the cover page is, talks about the U.S. Department of Education granting a $5 million, actually a grant from the federal government to the state in the fall of 2010. And that is called Mass Grad. What I, having a little trouble trying to follow is the PowerPoint where you're comparing Mass Grad in 2008 when it seems like it didn't come into place right. until the they, end of 2010. They went back and to, and to establish data, they deliberately went back to 2008, 2009. And I believe that's where they really changed the formula for, for the dropout. I, I think that they, for the first time, considered students who earned a GED as non-dropouts. So I think that's the rationale for going back to 2008. Why they didn't go back further, I don't know. Even though mass grad is something new? Something new. They, they needed, a, they needed a, uh, okay. a starting point. Um, do we have a grant? Have we applied for a grant to receive money for initiatives they, for us to use in our school district? From this program, no. They have not uh, opened grants up for us at this point. They are using the money statewide to help. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I have not seen any mass grad grants. You haven't seen any grants? From mass grad, no. They may be out there. Out of the, out of the $15 million that Massachusetts received from the state, I would have to check that, and I would certainly get that information for you. Okay, that would be good. Um, somebody else can ask a question. Dr. Domenico. Yeah, so, so what, what you're saying is that the state received the federal money? Right. And state is using as, I, as a resource right. and to I think, develop plans I think they that may, may not be, be funding individual initiatives for individual schools? Right. Is that They may very well possible? be doing that. Yeah, but they might be, yeah. As uh, I say, this, this is a relatively new program. Yeah. My, my question, uh, Mr. Bishop, goes to something else. You know, it has always uh, bothered me, bothered me, that there's a disconnect between the legal age that, that students uh, can voluntarily leave, which is 16. It's not tied to completion of high school and uh, the, the completion of high school that happens at 18, 19. So what we are really seeing statewide being reported is not a dropout age within the legally defined population. If we were to only look at the students by the age of 16, after which I don't think state should not count them as dropouts. If the state does not require them to remain in school, that if you're 17 and you decide to leave, that should not count as a dropout, right? So there's a disconnect that the state has put onto the high school to count students. But if you were to take those numbers that, that we just saw and remove the students that drop out at older than 16, do you have any idea how much lower the and, and legal dropout every, might be? Every student who dropped out is 16 or better. No one legally in the Commonwealth can drop out of high school before 16 years old. But we have them leaving before, right? No, we absolutely do not. We would, we would take But they the, disappear. Well, if they disappear, I mean, if they're not, if they're, right? you know, I can't control where people move to. No, 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 no. It's, it's not on you. It's, I'm, I'm just saying the way that we, we track these numbers. You know, yet we allow them to, to disappear at 16 and we count them as a dropout. How is that possible? I think what the state does, and if I can, maybe I can help a little bit, is, yeah. is the, the state looks at the kids who come in to any high school as a freshman, and that yeah. identifies them with what we call a cohort. Right. So regardless of what age they are when they start as a freshman, mm -hmm. I mean, a typical freshman is about 14, maybe 13 right. even, if he's really young, mostly 14. But we, all, we have freshmen who start at the high, uh, high school, they may go into the freshman year already 18 years old, or 16, or 17, because they just haven't got through middle school in a timely fashion. So, you know, uh, but, but legally they can't drop out. As Bill said, they can't drop out until they're 16. Now, if they move, you, you can't control that. Uh, but, but I think that's... But isn't that a contradiction in itself? 
If you are required to be in school until you're 16, why are they calling you a name after you leave? Well, once, once you identify, once you are enrolled at Southbridge High School or any high school yeah, in yeah. the country, really, as a no, freshman, you immediately are no. tracked. No. And if you no. leave that high school, unless you show up somewhere else, then you are tracked back to that high school. So the kids who disappear get tracked back. And that's one of the things we all struggle with because even if they come in as sophomores or juniors or seniors, they get identified with that cohort based on when they enroll. And they may only show up for a day or two and all of a sudden they disappear and they're, they're counted against your high school if they don't subsequently show up at a different high school. And, and if I may, the, summer, the ones who disappear over the summer, we are very aggressive. The, the police department has been very cooperative with us. Chief Charette has sent the officers up when we, if we have a school uh, uh, resource officer or not. Uh, they've been very willing. They go right to the houses and knock on doors and we'll find empty apartments. You know, in, in some, many cases we'll find empty apartments. How uh, do we deal with students that leave and come back and they leave and they come back? We, Is that we, more we, than we're, one we're count? We're obligated. As long as that student shows up on our door, we're obligated to enroll them as a student in public education. But, but that still counts as a single student, right? It's not like we have it's all based on the October 1 SIMS okay. data report. Okay, if a student is there October 1, he is part of that yearly dropout okay. formula. Okay. Ms. Prince I just wanted to um, speak a little bit further to what Mr. Ely was saying um, about the cohorts tracked from freshman year. The three students that presented three weeks ago, they got that information, no doubt, from the DOE website, because I downloaded it myself. Okay. And they have us, and it's that cohort from, from freshman year all the way up. They have us, the 2011 four-year graduation cohort is 19% dropout. Right, which would make a graduation the, rate of 81% with, the, with that in right. mind. And they have our dropout percentage in the five-year graduation rate at 20 percent, almost 21 percent. But, Mrs. Principe, just... Uh, but if, I, I'm just trying to say that I know that's where they must no, have gotten and, and this that's, from. And I just want to be clear. When, when we met with those three students, we said, uh, look, we just want to know where that data came from, okay? Because it's quite different to say that it's 18 percent. It, that's not an annual dropout rate. We look we at annual dropout well, we may know that, Mrs. Principe, we, but the public doesn't know that. Okay, the, pub that's fine. the public out there was the ones that, that came up at, I'll, I'll take for instance, I'm at a refresher course for an EMT class, and I have an employee of this town criticizing our high school, saying you have an 18% annual dropout rate. That is not the truth. The truth is we have a 5% dropout rate, and I agree with Mr. Bishop that. One is too many kids, but I don't want it out in the I didn't want it out in the public that we have an 18 percent annual dropout rate. That's why I asked Mr. Bishop to come here and discuss for the committee and the public that that population rate is we understand that because we live it every day, but the public doesn't understand that. Right, and we've had this discussion year after year when we received these reports about the cohorts. Dr. Hanley gave the same reports publicly, 18%, 20%, 21% dropout. I'm not agreeing with that dropout rate. I'm saying that this is most likely where the students got it because that's what's on the DOE website as far as cohort. Right. And, and just to your point, it wasn't to, this presentation wasn't reflected to criticize the students' data. This presentation, and we were very clear with those students. Mr. Bishop and I had a conversation with the students. We said as a school committee, we are gonna work with this group of students to make sure that we move this, their programs forward and their understanding of what's going on in the high school. So I met with Mr. Bishop and the students. I was there on another matter. And I said, let's talk to the students. And all, all we said to them is, is, look, what data, where did you get that data? Because our annual dropout rate is 5%. And clearly they said, well, we know we got it somewhere. We're not sure. So we said, that's great, but when we go out into the public, we want to just make sure that whatever the data is, we're able to explain where it came from and what it means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Selbridge School District does not have an 18% dropout rate. Yes, those seniors that were here tonight 
or the seniors of last year, that cohort when they started, 18% of them dropped out over that four year oh, period right, right. and five year, mm -hmm. but the annual rate is 5%. So, the, so our job as a school committee is to put out factual information and develop strategies <clears throat> to make sure that we can overcome <clears throat> these issues. Mr. Ely? I think, I think the, there, maybe I can clear up a little bit of confusion, maybe not, because there's a lot of terminology being thrown around and I wanna make sure everybody understands that when you talk about a dropout rate, you're not always talking about the same dropout rate. Mm -hmm. The cohort dropout rate, the four-year dropout rate, the five-year dropout rate, the annual dropout rate, the, the actual dropout rate versus what, you know, it's really, really difficult. It's, it's, it's to, to decide what, you have to pin people down. I mean, the girls that were here last week did a great job of pres presenting. They did not present it as a four-year dropout rate. They presented it as a cohort rate. They actually presented it as, a, as just the 18% dropout rate. And, and I think what Mr. Bishop's trying to do here is point out that, that there's a lot of different ways to look at it and, and that annual dropout rate of 5% a year is, is, is certainly a lot more acceptable than 18% a year. But it's not acceptable to him, it's not acceptable to us, and we all, I know, have strategies uh, in, involved in trying to fix that. But when you talk about dropout rate, it's really, really important to understand exactly what you're talking about. Exactly, and that's not as simple as just using the term dropout rate. And I think the other thing is, and this may sound really unusual, there's no correlation between the dropout rate, even the four-year dropout rate, and the actual graduation rate. Because the graduation rate is a different number calculated in a different way, and even though they're, they are so, they're sort of dependent, interdependent, they are not directly proportional. So an 18% dropout rate does not meet as 82% graduation rate as nice as maybe that might be. Uh, because we have kids who stay in school for another fifth year. We have kids who stay in school even for a sixth year. So I think, I think it's really important that everybody gets on the same page talking about those numbers and I appreciate the effort to try to put everybody on the same page here. But that, yeah. that number is, is something that we're concerned about. We're actually addressing tomorrow in a meeting that we, that we have here at my office. So. Uh, we will, uh, thank you, I appreciate uh, it. I, I would just like to uh, comment on the three young ladies who were here last week. Uh, Mr. Jovan and I had an opportunity to meet with them, as I said last week. I'd like to have a building full of young people like that. The tenacity, the maturity, the, the, the ability to present, uh, to, to articulate their frame of reference and their point of view was so refreshing to me and we, we had a wonderful dialogue. We have another meeting set up for the Monday after April vacation. And we want to keep their lines of communication. They, they brought, brought forth some good points. Uh, an hour for lunch, uh, I don't think that'll <laughs> be happening unless it's followed by a nap for me, but no. Uh, but they brought up some good points. You know, they're, they're concerned about the hoodies and uh, there's been an awful lot of dialogue on that in the, lo in the national media of late. Uh, it's great to hear from another side about how we can do things better. I don't think any one of us goes to work every day thinking we're doing the best million, million dollar job that we could do. I mean, every one of us can find some way to improve and I think these youngsters uh, put a little more thought on our plate. And I appreciate it and I really enjoy those youngsters. They're three nice kids. Mr. Lazo. Um, Mr. Bishop, thank you for being here. I, I do agree with you as far as one dropout is one too many. I think everybody up here um, believes that. Um, I've been on the board a long time, uh, and this has been an issue that we've been beating over the head since 1985, probably. Different administrators, different school committees. Uh, I think what the, what the, uh, I think the young ladies did a fine job in their research. There's nothing wrong with, it, with handing in research um, and data. But I think, you know, as a school committee, it's our job uh, to have clarification on some of this. It's our job to inform the public of the facts uh, as far as, you know, what is the real deal? I mean, I get beat over the head 24-7 that this bazillion dollar high school is gonna raise our taxes and this is gonna happen and that's gonna happen. It's our job as elected officials, it's our job as administrators uh, or elected officials to turn around and say, wait a minute, really? The last thing you need in the town of Southridge is more negativity. And I think that you can put a statistic out there. You can make statistics say whatever you want. 
But I think the point of clarification is a better line of communication. Uh, the students going into the, to the front office, into our office, you know, it's great to get online and pull up a number, throw it out there, and all of a sudden, boom, cartoons, letters to the editor. If that's what it's all about, it's our job to clarify um, and in a professional manner. Kids are kids. They're guided by adults. Maybe they didn't get the proper guidance on where to get what they wanted as far as the, uh, the data or however it worked. I just like the tenacity. I share that with you as far as these kids are true leaders of the community and, and, and of the student body. And I think that they have a place at Southbridge High School um, with their leadership. But again, I think what I saw was it needs a little discussion, maybe some guidance as far as, you know, some of the stuff that's going on in the school and how is it what happens to get a half hour lunch break or a longer lunch break or a different uh, scheduling? If I think the kids saw what administrators and school committees go through, whether it be policy, budget, and state laws, and all types of bylaws and, and policies, um, I think they would look at it a little differently. And I think that's where the young adults uh, need guidance. And I think it's our job to guide them and uh, to help them with a lot of this stuff. And, uh, get more people under the big tent, so to speak, so we can uh, move forward our district. But negativity, you know, I shake my head tonight because some people liked what went out there. That made me sick. But I think that, again, Mr. Jovan, uh, to his credit, to his leadership, to get people in front of us to articulate the message and to clarify what we're doing in the system. There, there is a lot of money being spent to educate kids. There's a lot of money being spent to alleviate dropouts, and I think that has to be public. It's public dollars. I think uh, it's our job to articulate that, and I think tonight uh, it's just another clarification. Uh, in, in another year that we, uh, we, we beat the graduation rate up and we beat the statistics up, but as long as the public understands and, and we move forward from here, I said it's going to be all positive as usual. Thank you. Anything further? Mr. Zigagora? I just, I just like to comment. I would just. Is this working here? Okay. I just would like to say this. Basically, if I'm sitting at home right now and I just watch this presentation, I still don't know what the heck you guys are talking about, to be honest with you. Uh, and I'm talking about the guy sitting at home after the last presentation we had. He's sitting there and he's saying these guys are doing a spin on this. That's what they're basically thinking. I think we need to explain a little more, uh, a little clearer to the guy sitting at home because he's getting these numbers thrown at him now. 18%, 5.5%, he's got this terminology, cohorts. He's, he's saying, I mean, I know I would be. If I was sitting at home and I'm saying, okay, I got a kid here, I wanna send him to uh, Southbridge High. I got someone here saying that the state's writing it down at 18%. Southbridge guys are saying 5.5%. The school committee is saying 5.5% but they're saying it's 5.5%, and then they're throwing out all this terminology that the guy in the street does not have any clue about, honestly. He has no, when you talk cohorts, come on. Are you kidding me? So the, the three people that came up here a couple weeks ago presented what they presented in good faith. They went, I don't know, you know, they're saying they don't remember where they got it. Apparently it was either fed to them by someone else or they went on the internet or whatever, but that's the number that was there. I don't know if a 5.5 showed up somewhere and then had a definition and they simply discounted that. I tend to doubt that. I tend to think that they went, well, hey, look, this is on the state website, must be what it is. And I'm sure that there were all the other schools listed as well. What I'm saying is this, is I'm saying that before we leave here, I think we really need to clarify where you're coming up with these numbers because, again, quite frankly, if I'm sitting at home and I'm talking uh, to my uh, wife or to my buddy and we're watching this, I'm still pretty lost as to where you came up with this. I think you need to actually define the 5.5 versus the 18. When we're talking about, look, the 18% or the 5.5, whichever, goes from freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, in senior year. And so if you're starting with a thousand kids and you're ending with 400 kids, that's one. Versus at the end of your senior year, what do you have? You need to explain that because the public, quite frankly, and, I, and please, 
if I am saying something out of line and I'm making it sound like, hey, the public's not intelligent, I apologize. I don't mean it like that. But I think that we need to make this extremely clear to the public and not just say, hey, you know, these are the numbers, come on. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gregorio, that is, is a point well taken because I, I do know that even in my own household, my wife struggled at times to, to, until she understood what the definition of the cohort meant. Yeah. What does a cohort mean? And that, exactly. that is a point well taken, and, and we do throw out all kinds of numbers. Um, and, and Mr. Lazo's point was correct. It, it, you throw out all these numbers, and, and you're right, too. That who knows what the heck's going on? And um, So, Mr. Ely? I think I can clarify some of this. The 5.5% represents the number of students who dropped out of our high school last year, not necessarily in a particular grade. They may have been a ninth grader, a 10th grader, or 11th grader, or 12th grader. We start out the year with X number of students. At the end of the year, we have X minus 5.5% along all four grade levels. Does that, that's the 5.5% dropout rate for that particular year. The entire school population. The entire school population. Exactly. The cohort is, the stu is a group of students who are in a particular start as a freshman in a particular grade and travel through together. But they may not stay together because they may, a kid may not get enough credits to go to become a sophomore. But they're still in that cohort even though they may take five years to graduate. Or they may never graduate, but they still belong to that cohort as it travels through time. And that's the four year, that cohort that they belong to when they graduate from school. How many of those kids are still in school? How many of them have transferred to another school? How many of them have totally left school altogether? We don't know where they are. Those are the dropouts. The ones who don't, we don't know where they went or they went to, they just came in, their parents dropped them out of school. Those are the dropouts. That's the 18% at the end of four years. There is no four year cohort dropout rate until you end the four years. But you have an annual dropout rate, which is changes every year depending on the, the student body that you have in your building. Okay. And Mr. Bishop, just so the public's clear, we talked about mass grad initiative, okay, and this grad initiative on the, on the, gr of the grant. And it's quite possible, and uh, Mrs. Prince Bay brings up a good point, I'd like to explore what other monies they're using with that, and perhaps the state has already earmarked with this 18 uh, age dropout rate that they want to raise it to, they're talking about initiatives to school districts to <coughs> assist you, so they may be having some of that money, but that would be another topic. So could you define, you did a little bit of a job on it, but when they said cohorts within that 133 schools, 74 districts, those types of districts, and correct me if I'm wrong, were districts that had the same Free and reduced lunch? No. Social no, economic? You, you got into that sizable cohort if you exceeded the state average dropout rate for the 2008-2009 school year. Okay. So out of that, do they then look at, within that cohort, schools that may have the same social economic status, the same demographics? demographics I'm sure there's, there's got to be some of those factors as well. They're moving to that direction. I know Mr. Zangi uh, brought some uh, data forward on that. Uh, is Jeff here? Yeah. He brought some on, that, on the dot. Com comparative districts. Yeah. Comparative, comparative districts. districts, right. We're looking at districts with similar, as you said, uh, free and reduced lunch. That's primarily the one that they're really using a lot. And we're in districts with, with similar demographics and, and similar challenges. Yeah. I think, I think the answer and, and is really simple. As free and reduced lunch goes up, traditionally dropout rates go up and graduation rates go down. And my argument and, and my mantra since I've been here is that doesn't make a difference. We have to be better than that. Oh, absolutely. We have to get our kids, as Bill said, and I think we all agree, one kid dropping out is too many. I don't care where they come from, what school district they're in, doesn't make a difference to me. If a kid drops out of Newton North, that's, that's just as bad as a kid dropping out of Southbridge High School or Wellesley. It doesn't make a difference it, 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 to me. We have to do what we can for our kids. And unfortunately, because our kids are maybe environmentally deprived at times, we may have to do more. And that's, I think, what this school committee has been committed to do, is as much as we possibly can. So uh, we could probably beat this one up all night, I think. Okay. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Thank you. 
next presentation for this evening is the new curriculum framework updates. Yes, I've asked both the ELA director, Karen Ryan, and Tammy Peralt, uh, our math director of math, uh, to do presentations tonight on the new uh, uh, curriculum frameworks that are coming uh, into the state that we're going to be held responsible for beginning next year. Uh, so I'll turn it over to the ladies to let them do their presentations and ask them to keep those presentations to 10 minutes. Good evening. You have to move that microphone down, Karen, or get the handheld microphone. Max is going to need one, too. Uh, you have to use your microphone. Oh, sorry. The reason I'm here tonight is that Mr. Ely wanted us to just give you a little bit better idea of what the new frameworks for ELA and math look like, so I thought we'd start with the ELA. And for the first time, um, there are new frameworks are based on the Common Core, which is um, 48 states have adopted them, but we have added things, so we're going to go through that. What makes Massachusetts actually better than just the Common Core. And for the first time, the literacy, power, uh, the literacy frameworks also include literacy in history, in social studies, in technical subjects, in science. So not only do we think of being literate in reading, you have to take your skills in reading and go forward and be able to use them in all subject areas. So um, the Common Core standards came from the, uh, adopted by the 48 states. The things that Massachusetts added were um, a strand for pre-kindergarten. We're um, the only state in the country that has added that preschool um, frameworks. Also, there's an expanded glossary and bibliography um, in the Massachusetts frameworks. and. As they did in the old frameworks, they used to call them the appendix. It's suggestions for literature for younger students and then again older students. So these are just some of the key ideas um, that are foundational for the um, Common Core for Literacy. Um, the biggest one is we want all our students, when they leave school, to be college and career ready. We want them to be able to go out and get a job and function well or be ready to go into college and not need remedial services when they get there. We want them to be able to read narrative texts. We want them to be able to read what we used to call nonfiction, which is informational text. Um, more than ever, we're asking our students to be able to write what we used to call um, expository text, but we're also going to argument text where people have to defend an argument because that's deeper thought is required, higher order thinking skills. So we're asking them to find evidence, we're tying reading and writing, and um, now it's not just the English teacher who's helping with these things. If you're a science teacher, if you're a social studies teacher, you want your students to be able to perform good literacy activities within your content area. So um, being literate is the heart of learning everything. If you can't read, you won't do well in science, you won't do well in social studies, you won't do well in math. Again, the key design principles, college and career focus. And we want things to be clear. There used to be 26 standards in the Massachusetts, old Massachusetts frameworks. There are now 10. But they, they follow in a nice vertical alignment. So this is what it looks like in first grade. This is what it looks like in fifth grade. This is what it looks like in 12th grade. So it's very clear. And we um, are looking for collaboration from grade to grade. So the way it's organized, book is kind of daunting, but there's a pre-K to 5 section and then a 6 to 12 section. The pre-K 
pre-K to five, it's reading, writing, speaking, and listening, and language. We expect children to be, to be proficient in all those areas. When you get to the six to 12, it's just reading and writing. So I, I'm not gonna go through all of these. These are the anchor, you have them in your PowerPoint. Um, these are the anchor standards for reading. The, re the reason I put those in here is I thought if any time you ever go through a classroom, <coughs> these are the things that you should be looking for. These are the th activities that should be happening. You're asking kids to do comparisons, to analyze, to interpret. These are all higher order thinking skills. I added writing, speaking and listening, and language. So you can go over those at your leisure. Um, this is what the standards look like in social studies, science. And you can see that they talk about citing evidence. So in other words, whatever subject area you're working in, we expect kids to go back and, and be able to find ev the evidence that supports why they formed a certain conclusion, why they have the ideas that they do, be able to defend their beliefs. Last two slides I think are most important. Um, number one, what does this mean for Southbridge? The, the bar has been set by the state and we are gonna work extremely hard to get our students to where they need to be. This is, um, we're in the curriculum mapping process right now that I think you've probably heard about at previous meetings. And it's all about curricular freedom. We know what we have to do. So we're gonna be trying to find as many resources as we can to support getting our students to that goal of mastering all these standards. We have to think about, there are gonna be some, st no students cannot learn, but there will be some students that will, might need a different resources or a different timetable, but we are committed to having every child learn and master these standards. And that we're all really stakeholders, you as a school committee, myself as an administrator, all the teachers that I work in, we're all a team and we're working towards um, success for all our students in literacy. Now this is um, the last slide and it's our plan of action, what we are currently doing and where we are headed. Uh, we have created a curriculum mapping team. There are teachers from all the schools going from pre-K to grade 12, working with administrators. And we have um, recently begun a collaboration with the Achievement Network. And what we're going to be doing is creating standards-based, vertically aligned curriculum where things match the frameworks and follow along in a very orderly fashion. So if you're a sixth grade English teacher, you know what they covered in fifth grade, you know what you need to cover, and you know what the seventh grade teacher is gonna be covering. So what we're doing is um, creating a calendar of when things will be taught. Um, we will integrate planning so the teachers are all, all with the, the same program and that we will have interim assessments. They will be four times a year in ELA. Um, we're going to have identify con concrete tools. They are things that we already have. There might be a few things we might add to fill in any gaps in the standards. And we will be developing um, units that are aligned by the standards and daily lesson plans, which will be used in our, with our collaboration with Atlas Rubicon, which is um, a mapping, a software mapping company, and we will be using what's called Understanding by Design, and it's a backward design template that includes things like all the understandings the students have to have, the essential questions the teachers need to ask to get the students to their goals, and they'll have specific performance tasks and learning activities to get them to that goal. Does anybody have any questions? I know it was very quick. Questions? Comments? No? Okay. Thank you. Ms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Let me just log off of ELA here. Get rid so of one and put the other one up, right? What's, yeah, right. Give me a second. This math. And we're going to do the slideshow. Oh, back already. Good evening. Um, I want to take this opportunity to, th to thank you for having me. I haven't been able to present to the school committee yet, so this is my first time. So um, I'm thoroughly enjoying my time here in Southbridge. This is a wonderful community, and I don't have to tell you that. You already know that. But I've been greeted warmly by most everyone, and, and I'm thoroughly happy to be here. So thank you. Um, 
I, I, if, Karen, if you could pass out mine. Um, I'm gonna, now, we're now going to hand you my PowerPoint and my book. And I, right from the get-go, you're going to see the differences between math and ELA. Karen's ELA frameworks is horizontal and mine is vertical. And the differences go on from there. <laughs> These are very different books, very different alignment. Um, so we're going to have very different paths in this journey. Okay. Again, uh, Karen had already um, deciphered what the differences are between the Common Core standards in the Massachusetts frameworks. But the last time I had met with Dr. Domenko, she had asked for some sort of flowchart explaining the difference with the standards, et cetera. So actually, that's on the very last page of your handout for math. And the math one is uh, the maroon and gold. The very last page, you'll see a flowchart um, just explaining what 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 are standards and domains and strands and so um, if you have any questions I'll, I'll, I'll maybe afterwards you can certainly ask them. Um, in the Common Core math frameworks um, Massachusetts accepted them as they were except we added some things in math that we weren't happy with. So these are the statistics on what we went ahead and added. Um, K to 8. There were a number of additions. Um, at the high school level they actually inserted an entire pathway that was not um, available at the Common Core level. Um, this is just the summary of what's happening K to five, and basically what's happening is the, um, how can I say, um, it says a solid foundation of what I call number sense. Fractions, decimals, and percents um, are really going to be hammered home at the elementary level prior to coming up into the middle and high school grades. So supposedly, mastery is going to happen at that level in a perfect world. Um, the, in the, the beyond K to five, um, the middle grades are really going to be focusing on a rich, robust curriculum, um, which will then prepare them for the high school where they can apply and model what they've learned in mathematics. Uh, these are our key principles, and really what I want to focus on of these six um, phrases is depth versus breadth. These Common Core standards, are, are these Massachusetts frameworks, are vastly different, different than the 2000-2004 frameworks. Um, the 2000-2004 really spiraled, whereas that is no longer occurring. We're looking to, to, to master these topics in, in the fewest number of grades possible instead of carrying them through 10 different grades. Um, the organization of this book here, okay, which you can certainly see. Um, our previous frameworks, pre-K to 8, um, included five different types of math strands. Um, now with the new frameworks, say in grade 5, they will no longer be learning, uh, of course I choose grade 5 as the example and that's the exception. Um, in grade 4, they will no longer be learning five different types of math throughout the year. They're only going to be learning three, which is going to loosen up that, that calendar for teachers to get in and dig deeper. Okay. Um, this is right from the DESE website, from a great uh, PowerPoint called the Overview. Um, and the solid colored blocks and if, are, are vertically what the kids will be learning in those grade levels. So if you look at grade three, you have three in the purplish pink, and then it do, you have nothing in the orange, which is actually the algebra, um, the algebra strands or domains now. Um, geometry is the only domain that is carried through pre-K to eight. Um, and then mass measurement, data, and stats, and probability. So, whereas those used to be colored in all, like solid, they used to learn all of it all the time. What's yeah, go ahead. The, what's the black one? I I'm sorry, it's, just, it's really, it's blue, it didn't come out great. Measurement and data, measurement and data. Okay, and our plan of action is the same as ELA's. Uh, we are, you know, certainly starting our curriculum mapping with a phenomenal group of teachers. Um, we've, we both have formulated district math teams and district ELA teams that we've um, already met with. Um, we're going to be collaborating with Achievement Network, which is going to lead us into this curriculum mapping process. Um, and, the, and then our Atlas Rubicon, which is really the template for unit planning. Um, which this is, this, is not some, this is not an overnight process. This is certainly an extended period of time. We're going to be working on this. As in my next slide, I brought up a few, the same frequently asked questions. I had met with some of you at a smaller subcommittee meeting. And I, and I kept these on the slide because I think they're real, it's really important for the public and the additional school committee members to know um, some, of, 
some of your concerns are things that we're addressing. And I, I know Dr. O'Leary um, is concerned about why are we still curriculum mapping? I, I heard you, you know, a number of meetings ago, and, and I think it's important to address that. We're still curriculum mapping because that's a live document. It's, it's, it's living, and it's changing, and it's breathing year to year to year. Um, what we really want is we want a strong, um, very, very strong living document going into these brand new frameworks that will stay in place with all the changes, and you just make modifications instead of starting from scratch every year. Okay, um, and then um, the question, the second thing you all said to me the first night you met me is, what are we doing with everyday math? And my question, my answer to you is, it's unknown. We are going to find out probably very soon um, through the curriculum mapping process with the teachers, with the practitioners. We're going to be addressing it because these standards are so different. My concern is that everyday math uh, may not meet the needs of our new standards. And I have been doing some research. Um, the District of Columbia was actually using everyday math. And they tried to align to the new Common Core standards. And they found it almost impossible that they got rid of everyday math entirely. So I am looking into it. I'm researching it. It's not going to be a quick decision. And it's not going to be one without forethought. So thank you. Any questions? You. Questions? Comments? Please, Mr. yes. Take your time as far as everyday math, but when you get rid of it, I fully endorse it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any further questions? Anything. I'm not going to jump to any decisions, though, right? <laughs> 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 One of the things that we've already discovered is it's, it, it's really difficult to map everyday math. That's what, that's what the teachers have already found out. So. Uh, if there aren't any questions for, for Tammy, I'd like to thank both of you for being here this evening thank and for the you. work that I know you did, and, and I like the way that they, they mirrored each other because that uh, shows we're working as a team, and that's really, really important. Uh, I, I will say that much of what you saw tonight with these two ladies is, is our initiatives that, that go through our strategic plan and, and go through our accelerated plan as well. Thank you. Moving on, report to the superintendent, Mr. Ely. Yes, uh, as you know, we have submitted our uh, new accelerated improvement plan, and we've already begun the implementation of that. We have a meeting tomorrow with the administration, a four-hour meeting to actually uh, sort of uh, identify who's going to do what, when, how, why, and and how, uh, and with what materials it's going to require us to do that. So that will map that curricula that that. Uh, uh, that plan out for implementation. Uh, while we've already done some things that are in it, uh, they, they won't obviously be in that. We've already done those things and we'll continue to do them. One of the things that has, is consistent from both our first plan uh, all the way through all five plans that we've now done and submitted uh, is we need to identify within Southbridge what our expectations are for teachers. What does good instruction look like? So we started as an administrative team for a few meetings talking about what we're looking for when we go in and do our learning walks and what we're doing when we go in to observe teachers, uh, what we expect to see in every classroom. We started with a kind of an unwieldy term, but you're going to see at the top of this page, and it's called the District Administration Definition of High Quality Instruction. That is now going to become what we call the South Bridge Standard. So the Southbridge standard that you're going to see tonight is a draft because our next step right now, it's right now in the hands of the teachers, uh, going through the teachers union and to get their input and in anything that they'd like to add to it or that they'd like to see reworded. So we're working with them and then we give it to you uh, for your input. So you're going to get a copy of this tonight and I would welcome you to, to read it over carefully at your leisure because what it really does is it, it, I think it defines high quality instruction in any environment. But what we want to do is make it unique to Southbridge. And we've added quite a bit to it, actually, since we originally started, because we feel like things are important. And one of the things we've been noticing as we go into classrooms is some classroom walls are bare. They have no sensory input for students at all regarding the subject matter. And some of them you go into and you don't know what to look at first. There's thousands of things on the wall that, that may not be all pertinent to the, the teaching and learning going on in the classroom. So that's been added to this, this uh, what we are now calling the Southbridge Standard. So I would welcome your input to that uh, anytime in the near future. Uh, and then our next and final step will be to take this draft to a group of community uh, leaders. 
Uh, we'll be bringing a group of people together to give this to them as, as uh, an explanation of, or de definition of what we expect in Southbridge from our teachers. And I think the teachers will appreciate it. My feedback from the teachers so far has been very positive. Uh, they recognize most of the things on here as things we talk about every day. Uh, it actually mirrors very, uh, very closely the, uh, uh, some of the, 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 the indicators of high quality instruction that are within the new educator evaluation framework that's mandated by the federal government and the state government. Uh, but that's uh, where we are right now. We're, we're to the point of giving it to you, getting feedback from the teachers. The next and final step will be to finalize it with a group of parents and, and uh, people from the community. Uh, and it will be then become published to our teachers and our, and our community as the Southbridge standard for all teachers in our district. So when we do evaluations, observations, uh, learning walks, monitoring uh, uh, the, the education that's going on in these classrooms, we'll all be talking the same language. And I'll, and I'll leave my report at that. Mrs. Principe? Yes, um, you submitted uh, the revised accelerated improvement plan to the state. Do we have a time frame that we will hear back from them as to whether it's accepted or not? What's been their time frame has been anywhere from six to eight weeks, four to six weeks, depending. I think it'll be a little faster this time. They have not given us any definite. I should be able to find out something on Thursday. I have a meeting with somebody here from the DESE. Uh, but I, I think we've been working with them along the way on this new revised plan, so I think that we should get a fairly quick turnaround. They've, they've already approved conditionally our, uh, what we call our, our, our main drivers, uh, the main uh, areas of focus, which I think you've all seen this document somewhere along the line. Uh, this is the new version of that. I'll give you a copy of that uh, this, uh, in your Friday packet. Uh, but not much has changed, but some things have been shifted over into a different line at the request of the state. Uh, so you won't see a lot of new things in here, but we have taken some things out that they didn't think were uh, going to be immediately impacting the classroom. Uh, but we feel like the new plan should be get approval uh, relatively quickly, I'm hoping by spring break, but, but I can't swear to that. Are they, is the state, aren't the, isn't the state due to come and give us another report in April? Yes, uh, the meeting I have Thursday is, 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 is called a highlight report, mm -hmm. a highlight meeting, and that is actually, uh, serves a dual purpose of being the quarterly report meeting, which will then f uh, follow from that meeting, will be written the second quarterly report, which will then come to me as a draft, and then they'll come present to you, and I'm anticipating that would be in the end of April but I haven't got a firm date on them yet. Thank you. Any further? Mr. Lazo? Um, Eric, uh, to and through the chair, the, the uh, district definition of high quality of instruction, um, I like it. I, I think you know, input by the teachers would be wonderful and by the school committee and any other players in the district. Um, does it have to be done in a question? Does the teacher use <laughs> the variety or should we put it in a statement? Well, we, reason, we had a lot of conversation about that, actually. The reason it's in a question format is because uh, in our discussion uh, was we want the teachers asking themselves the question, do I do that? Is that what my classroom looks like? So we felt like putting the, the Southbridge standard in the form of a question, it would lead the parents, the teachers, the students, everybody to be asking the questions about, is my classroom, does my classroom look like this? Uh, so we did have a lot of conversation about it being put in question format, uh, and uh, you know it doesn't have to be in that format, but it but it seems to to, to serve the purpose of of uh, of why if, we're having it. If if I could just take it a step further, I I I, uh, I don't I'm not against having it in question form for teachers or for parents, but I think this document should be printed like the Seven Commandments, where it is what it is, call it what it is and let's live by it. Uh, if we start asking questions, you know, and again, I think, you know, it's all warm and fuzzy and sweet, I'm sure, that, you know, does a teacher do this and does a teacher do that? Um, very politically correct, I guess, but when I look at this, these are seven great standards that I think that should be put in statement form and printed and, and, and posted. 
in a building, in the classrooms, everywhere, because this is like a, a school model type thing, like we should live up to our yeah. standard. And I don't know, I'm just suggesting it. I'm not saying it's going to be that. For the woman fuzzy, we'll ask questions. For the ones who want to get it done, we'll put it in statement. I, I think that, the, and, and your point is well taken. We did have that discussion, just so you know. You're, you're not asking a question that hasn't been asked by teachers and administrators, but I think the key is we, we reinforce it with every classroom observation or evaluation that we do. So we're going to be asking the teachers in a meeting, when we meet with the teacher after an observation, did you meet this standard? Did you do this? Is this, is this evident in your classroom? So I, I think the reason it's in question format is, is that, but, but I understand your point. You know, I, I come from a coaching mentality. If you're going to coach, we coach. If we're going to ask somebody to do it, not expect them to do it, we pay a lot of money, we should expect it, not ask it. That's all I'm saying. But I understand. Whatever, anything's better than what we have. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? See none, report of the business manager. Do you have anything? A couple of brief things. Uh, first, uh, a couple of updates on uh, purchasing of furniture, fixtures, and equipment and technology. We had a very successful uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment bid opening. We had at least one bid for all of our different bid groups. All of them came in under budget. Um, in looking and projecting the budget out, even if the few individual items that were not bid were purchased at or even slightly above what we've budgeted for them, the FF and E budget will come in under budget. So once we've shored up all those purchases, um, the school building committee and uh, you know and the leadership of Mr. Lazo kind of go back and look at seeing if there are other things that we defrayed initially from our initial FF and E budget that we might go back and revisit. Uh, technology, this week we're trying to wrap up the telephony and the uh, local area network pieces of the technology. Uh, following that will probably be the wireless technology and the last piece of the puzzle will be the actual um, uh, machines, if you will. Um, so that's all progressing. And then uh, just on a slightly different note, I know certainly there's been a lot of, uh, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago we had a question from a member of the public where were we on the redistricting of the elementary schools. We've actually completed our first pass. Um, quite frankly, we're doing some tweaking now to, obviously we want to try to balance the populations as much as we possibly can, um, but we need to do so in a logical fashion and obviously there's a number of considerations in doing that. So again, I think we're on target to being able to have that ready to be released um, you know, before vacation. Questions, comments? Okay, thank you, sir. Moving on, school committee actions. We have no actions this evening. Unfinished business, I, I put these on the agenda so that we just don't forget yeah. about them. Nope. Um, so, uh, and I think my plan would be going forward because these are some very important topics for the school committee to have them as standing items on the agenda so that if there is, there is any update, it can be presented. So that would be my, my yep. uh, <coughs> goal for the remainder of the year. So with that, we had the district reconfiguration updated progress. I think Terry just updated. Is Terry, there anything Terry else? did some, yeah. And, and while Terry's been working on the computer, I've been meeting with the, uh, the teachers uh, at all three buildings, at uh, three elementary buildings. We gave them a form uh, to fill out to indicate whether they would like to stay in their grade level for next year or whether they, it was more important for them to stay in their building and then be assigned to whatever grade level that the principal wanted them to teach. We had those forms got returned to me today. Uh, so once we have the identification of the number of students in each building by grade level, we'll know the number of sections of each class by grade level, and then we'll be able to take those teachers' requests and accommodate as many of them as we can within reason uh, using that, that, that their choices. I mean, uh, we feel like it's important that if a teacher really is dying in the wall, I have to stay as a fifth, fifth grade teacher. If we can accommodate that, we should. Uh, if, if we can't, then we'll have a good reason why we can't. So uh, that's the next step. Once we get that, the, the finalization of the line, which we'll need you to approve, I think, uh, because it sets boundaries for the school district, for, for the schools in the future, uh, then I think we'll, we'll be, in the meantime, be able to identify uh, how, many, how many classes of first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade we're going to have in all these buildings. Our biggest sticking point right now is the demographic breakdown. Uh, the numbers, as we, we actually started with, with Main Street as sort of the boundary. Uh, one side West Street, one side Charlton Street. And uh, the, when we did that, the numbers were like within two students. 
So the numbers of kids on one side of, of Main Street and the other side of Main Street is almost even in grades one through five for next year. But demographically, they're not. So we have to do some tweaking to that to make sure that we don't have an unbalanced, uh, two buildings that are unbalanced demographically. So I think we'll be able to do that fairly quickly, uh, but, but our target date was spring break, and I think we're going to meet that. Okay. Thank you. Um, any questions? Ms. Woodruff? One question. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a question for the superintendent. Um, we were um, presented with a proposal this evening, and I was wondering if you'd be able to um, look at that while you're doing these reconfigurations and come back with us at the next meeting with an answer for the student, uh, for the teacher who presented that proposal to see if that is something um, that we should be doing or looking at or if it's already been looked at or however so that we can have an answer for us and, yeah. and the teacher who presented that to us. I've, I've answered the question three times and so I think that's why it came to you uh, because they don't like my answer. Uh, you passed a reconfiguration based on a pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, readiness first grade, Eastford Road and two one through five buildings. That's been the way we've looked. We haven't looked at doing a K-1, 2, 5, because that wasn't the configuration that the subcommittee of curriculum recommended and came to the school committee even as an option, I don't think. So I would reject it, and I have, uh, from that standpoint, but certainly it's within your rights to change that. But uh, there are issues with the special area schedules. Uh, I chose to bring the nine teachers in, in those special areas and meet with them. Many of them have since thanked me that we involved them in the decision making process. It's not easy to figure out how to make sure that we cover the contractual obligations, but also cover the, all the classes. But, but I added a little caveat, I said, can you do it and actually make the program stronger? So that was where they're trying to go, trying to make the program stronger, trying to mirror the two programs in both the two one through five buildings. And the, the teachers have been emailing each other back and forth since that meeting with really great ideas. And I've stayed out of that fray because I want them to resolve it themselves because they're the ones that have to live with it. Uh, and the, we'll now bring the principals into the next conversation and, and have them part of that decision making process. Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, item is the ad hoc committee on the maintenance department update. And then it's Mr. Lazo's ad hoc. Yeah, I'd just like to say that it's on hold, in a holding pattern to the, uh, once we go into April, we're supposed to do a, uh, well, I'll, I'll call a meeting with Terry and, and the powers to be to discuss tour and walk through and uh, look at this all over again. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of ideas and tire kicking. I just think that it won't take long, but I know Terry's been busy with the budget, the new school, so I think uh, we'll wait until probably the second week of April uh, in order to have a meeting. Thank you. Next is the accelerated improvement plan. Mr. Ely updated us on that. Is there anything further you want to add? Uh, just one more thing. Uh, what, what happens in this plan is we're we are required by the state to implement the plan, whether it's approved or not. So we are now in the process of actually finishing up the implementation of a plan that was rejected and beginning the implementation of the new plan that was submitted. The nice thing about it is we made sure that the plans actually marry pretty well together. In other words, there's not very much new stuff in it. It's just formatted differently. Uh, so I think that, that as we implement, we're not going to be changing a lot of what we've been doing all year. Uh, the, uh, our, our next charge really is to have this meeting with, with uh, our, over, our, our monitor and get the second quarterly report done on the implementation of the plan that was not approved. And thank you for getting that information out in a timely manner uh, that we had requested at the last meeting, so appreciate that. Any questions on any of that information? Okay, new business. Next regular school committee meeting will be held on April 10th, 2012 in the council chambers. Next item that I have is the superintendent's evaluation process. Just uh, per our policy, um, we're coming up on April is to, to have that process uh, completed. So um, that's why I put it on the agenda. Uh, we need to uh, discuss as a, as a school committee, uh, pursuant to the contract with the superintendent that it's uh, between the school committee and the superintendent to agree on the instrument. The state has put a new instrument in place as far as educator uh, evaluations so I'm looking to set a meeting next week special school committee meeting so that we can meet as a school committee and discuss this with Eric 
come up with what that template will look like so that we can uh, hopefully get the process either completed by the April timeline, if not by the first meeting in May. Uh, but I don't want to go much further than that uh, in the timeline. I think we have enough information as far as um, what our school district goals are, um, what's transpired in the last year, year and a half, uh, to fairly evaluate the superintendent uh, on those uh, items on the district. Do you have anything to add, Eric? On that? Or you Not at say? this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other new business from anyone else? Just a couple of things under new business that I'd like to discuss. Um, one, uh, I've been approached by the members of the Lions Club about a donation that they'd like to make to the new, new Southbridge High School in memory, they have some money in memory of Mr. Welch, uh, who was a long time um, teacher in Southbridge High School. Uh, they're looking to donate the money and the question came up as to would they be able to maybe have a plaque put up in a room dedicated to Mr. Welch. And I'm not sure what the process that would go through. I know we have a school committee process on naming um, different rooms. Mr. Lazo? I, I, I too have been getting, uh, the Zotos family uh, had a young child into music that passed on that wants to donate money. I know Mr. Javasi has been a representative of the family in Florida. Uh, they're a South Beach family. Uh, we also had a class of, I want to say, 50, I hope they don't get mad at me, that had some leftover money in their treasury that they wanted to do something at the school. So I, I, I look to Terry as far as, you know, uh, dedicating things and stuff like that is a different uh, ball game. But as far as people that want to donate, we have, we have people that, you know, want a small plaque to say so-and-so donated some money, and I, I'm not sure um, the financial handling of that does not go in, uh, maybe we should create a fund or um, have a meeting and try and, and deal with this. What's happening is with the new building, the more we tour, the more people want to do something, which is great. I mean, we have teachers that want greenhouses. We want people that want to get involved. So I think instead of holding people back, I think we've got to open up and, uh, and let the people in as far as how to handle this. Terry? That's easy. <laughs> we'll always take money, no. Uh, seriously, we have uh, what's a, a revolving account for um, what I call public school donations. And essentially, if a member of the public or an organization wanted to make a donation, they would go through the process of uh, probably sending a letter to the committee, because the committee does have to accept the purpose uh, of that donation, but then we would simply deposit that money in the revolving account and the expenditures associated with whatever those, that purpose would be uh, would come out of that particular designated line within the revolving account for public school donations for that purpose. They, they seem to want some sort of recognition or to spend it on something in a particular area. One was music. I know Mr. Mm -hmm. Welch was a former teacher, an athlete. Um, I'm not sure if we can have a committee meeting and talk about an honor roll or some sort for you know, people that do this. Um, yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's wide open. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure we can figure yeah. out a way to, to accept the money, but I, my, my bigger question is the building itself uh, and what we can do for donors. I know that they have, like the Harrington Memorial Hospital, walk in, the donor, the wing, the this, that. Okay. I'm not sure you want 5,000 plaques all over the school, but uh, especially after you look at all the ceramic tile that's being put in, but to do something, I don't know, in, in, outside the building, inside the building, uh, for an honor roll for the alumni that do donate. Mrs. Uh, Dr. Domingo. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think maybe we, I don't know if we need a new subcommittee for that or appointed committee for ad, ad hoc task of the site or, or coming up with strategies. But there, there's a number, and we are all aware of them, number of uh, strategies that different institutions have adopted for honoring and naming donations. Uh, it goes from brick buying and brick imprints in, in, in a walkway that leads to, to something, to naming the auditorium after a person for, I don't know, $2 million donation, to, to all sorts of different opportunities. And I, I think if we brainstorm, we, we might be able to come as a, as, a, as a group to a couple of three possibilities how to honor people that have invested. I know that, and, and this is just literally off the top of my head, I know that uh, we were talking when we visited the building that 
certain passages will have street names. Right. You know, so maybe there's something that we could connect with donors and have, have them recognized in a very unique and specific way to the school. I don't know. But I think between three, four people getting together and really brainstorming some strategies, uh, we, we could come up with something that would be probably acceptable. That's fair. I think first, Terry, if you could just take a look at our policy. I can do see that. if there's any policy language, and then we'll right. come back to the next yeah. meeting and come no. up with yeah. where we would go just so we can get back to some of these people because they'd like to, to get going on this. I, I certainly can do that. And, and while this would not be the type of permanent thing you're talking about, one thing that just popped into my mind is we will have a video signage system within our new high school, middle high school. So there will be tel television screens throughout right. various areas yeah. that we will be able to put signage. And I would think one of the recurring signs we might want to put up would be thanks to donors who donated yeah. various things for that. Again, not a plaque, but another way of recognizing them. Right. Mr. Chairman, could we have a subcommittee of the whole um, well, sometime I, in the next I, I, meeting? What we could do is, um, uh, Terry can look it up, and next week we can yep. bring it up just as a quick agenda item. Yep. Next week when we do the superintendent evaluation process, then we can okay. move that forward. So. Okay. The next thing that I had is, um, I, will, I, along with the, Mr. Ely and Ms. Shaw, attended the meeting with Representative Durant, um, held over in uh, Dudley. It was quite an informative evening on Chapter 70 money, um, some of the trials and tribulations of funding. I know Terry was out of state and uh, regrettably couldn't be there. Um, it's a tough year, I think, budgetary-wise, Chapter 70-wise. Uh, we're, we're looking at a budget where we have an increase of about a million, what was it, four? Million three. Million three. Um, with some challenges with the town, I know the town's working through their budget. I was shocked to hear what trouble some other of our colleagues in other districts are facing, specifically um, Dudley Chowton. Dudley Chowton's facing a $4.1 million deficit that they have to cut um, very seriously. So I think. We've positioned ourselves as a school committee very well. Kudos to my fellow colleagues. On when the times were really tough, we were purposeful in the use of our stimulus money um, and not putting a lot of positions through that stimulus money. And I think now some of those other surrounding towns are feeling more pain because they used it as a stopgap, hoping that um, the economy would turn around faster, yeah. and we were pretty uh, surgical in the way that we strategically use that money. So it was a great meeting. Uh, Representative Durant's uh, next, uh, we're targeting to have uh, his next round table at the new high school. He's very eager to have a meeting at that new high school. So we look forward to that. Um, and that's all I have. Any, anything else? New business? Okay, seeing none. School committee reports curriculum, Mr. Digagorin. Uh, very brief. Very briefly, last night we met, uh, discussed a couple things. We had the subcommittee there, as well as some members of the uh, committee as a whole, as well as uh, the superintendent Jeff Zangi. And one of the things we talked about uh, was assessment testing, and really, it was really a learning experience for us more than anything else. Uh, we asked questions, and uh, Mr. Zangi gave us the answers. We we were questioning different assessment testing like Galileo, like Dibbles, things like that. What's effective, what's not effective, and if it's not effective, why wasn't it effective? Uh, was it simply something that uh, didn't test a certain area that it was expected to? Was it something to do with the tester or the testees? Uh, so that was, that was uh, very interesting. Uh, we also talked a lot about the uh, middle school and the high school, and how uh, a lot of the things that the problematics of uh, being, you know, a mile apart now uh, geographically are going to be uh, done away with being in the same, uh, under the same roof, so to speak, and how not only are the students going to be assimilating quicker than they would now, but so are the teachers and. Uh, while the teachers are even now uh, between the high school and the middle school exchanging ideas so that when you leave the middle school and you're going up to the high school, there is a continuation. We have a, uh, we have a stronger understanding and we, of how that is going to be uh, 
a lot stronger in the next coming years uh, as teachers will be able to literally walk, you know, 150 feet to discuss something, uh, whereas before you had to get into the car, or you had to get online, or you had to uh, make a phone call to discuss the same things. Thank you. Uh, just to tag on to some of the things that, that, that were also put at that meeting, I think the superintendent and Mr. Zangi did a great job about talking about some of the exciting things that are going to take place in the new building. Uh, one of the things that I really was excited to hear was on a pre-engineering program and our partnership that they're developing with WPI on Project Lead the, Lead the Way, Yes. Uh, which I think is going to be a great uh, program. Um, also um, talking about integrated environmental technology programs, and I know those will all be in the minutes. Um, but a lot of great work was done at that committee uh, meeting, Mr. DeGorio, and uh, one of the issues that did come up that I just want to refer over to um, policy is that Mrs. Principe had brought up a question about our bump policy and perhaps that we should uh, take a look at our behavior uh, policy. Uh, we haven't done so in a long time. Um, so I would ask that that be referred to uh, Mrs. Woodruff in policy so that we can take a, a look at it, um, see if, if we need to tweak and get teachers and staff on board and looking at that. So, all right, so we refer that over to you. And with that, I'll, I'll change that to Mrs. Woodruff in policy. Yes, I don't have any reports this evening, but I um, will like to set a date tonight in stone for our next policy <laughs> subcommittee meeting. Um, to discuss the, the bump policy and then we need to discuss kindergarten age. Um, so hopefully I'll have that set tonight and I will set that, send that information and the agendas out to everyone once I have that date set tonight. Okay, thank you. Budget facilities, transportation, Dr. Domenko. Uh, no, no report, <coughs> nothing scheduled at the time. Thank you. Collective bargaining, Mr. Lazo. No report at this time. <clears throat> Building committee report. Building committee, um, our next school, <laughs> Building committee is Wednesday, April 25th, 2012, in the Hyman Room. The next tour is at, on April 21st, 2012, 9 o'clock in the morning. If you do not want to come to the town hall, we will have the forms on site to, to eliminate a, a process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to enlighten the people that the realtors of the surrounding towns in Southbridge will be about 20 to 25 realtors touring on the 26th. Hespera will be touring 20 to 30 people. And we have Upward Bound, which is going to be another tour of about 20 people. Um, we've been touring small groups on Friday afternoon with department heads, townspeople, teachers, mostly teachers, um, and secretaries, guidance, whomever wants to, uh, to, to make it. It's a small group tour of about four or five every week. Can can you give me an idea of when it would be safe to take fifth graders through there? <laughs> say that, say that so again. Would it be safe to take a, like fifth graders with their parents through there? Because I'm trying to think about when we might talk up to, about scheduling I, I, a fifth grade I think, trip. I think by the middle of April uh, at the next job meeting when you and I go in, I think we're going to see a big difference. I know the... Uh, it looked the, better today when I was yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, the gymnasium is locked down. Uh, the cafeteria is in high gear where it's to the point where they're in a terrazzo pouring. Uh, you're not going to see parts of this building. So what we're doing is we have uh, safety barriers and issues such as open electrical panels, uh, open heating systems. I think by the second week of April, as far as kids, it's very dangerous for kids, adults, not a problem. Um, but usually you have to let me know ahead of time on the small tours because we keep them around five or six. Uh, so there isn't a big crew because we don't have a lot of coverage. We do a big uh, tour. What we do is Mr. Jovan, Mr. Bishop, sometimes uh, the administration here, uh, we, we, we volley back and forth on the tour, talking about technology, talking about uh, different things in the building. But, uh, yeah, I would say the second week of April is going to be real safe. The gym will be open. So if uh, I start talking to them about it early May, we should be fine. Oh, absolutely. I, I would just like to add that uh, the gym has been barriered off, and, and I know that you saw the gym. Uh, I did. I saw and, and I saw the gym today. And I had to come in today and tell some of the school committee members, it's absolutely breathtaking. I have not seen a gymnasium like this um, in my time on earth. And I just got to say that uh, the planning and development of this is going to be a big pride thing when those doors open up. It's not just the, the auditorium. It's everything that's happening up there. It's state of the art. 
Uh, and I think when you turn around and see our kids under a, in a stairwell running a concession stand, that's going to have a concession stand to make money for their uh, class or their prom and stuff. I think it's just, I think the teachers' administration and all the people that have their fingerprints on this project have hammered it out. We continue to hammer it out and we continue to have changes as we funnel everything into the June 18th completion date uh, ballpark. I think we're, again, on time and under budget. Uh, I came out of a meeting today that uh, we have another budget meeting next week, but it's, it's, uh, it's accelerating. I think uh, John LaPearl and Casigli uh, are just an admirable company to deal with uh, when there's a problem. I like this style. We don't have problems, we just have solutions and they, and they knock it out. I know Terry and, uh, and Eric can attest to that. They're well, they just don't want to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. With that, there is no executive session tonight. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Name is all present. Thank you and have a good evening.